Good morning, uh, distinguished faculty members and colleagues and friends. Um, the last two days have been truly enlightening and stimulating. I really want to express my appreciation for this opportunity and to be in the same room with you for the last two days. And, uh, and now I have the task to represent our breast cancer team to present our work on designing a phase two trial um, for tivatinib in breast cancer. And the team had a, actually a very vivid discussion. In the beginning, we really didn't know uh, what we're going to do, and no clue really. <laughs> we're thrilled in the end, actually, we have a consensus on what trial should look like, and uh, so this is great. And uh, I mentioned our task is really to design phase two trial, and the purpose of this phase two trial is to inform a go no go decision for further clinical development options for tivatinib in breast cancer. So that's the really the goal of the trial. And uh, you know, in order to help you to understand why we propose the trial, we're going to show you later. Uh, we need to have give, we need to give you some context of, of why we propose such a trial. Uh, based on the the briefing document we received um, from the organizer, um, we we can summarize really the information we get into three bullet points. One is that the scientific rationale for this drug in breast cancer is rather limited, and uh, the biological role for CMAT and this pathway in breast cancer is poorly defined. And the in vitro and in vivo activity of tivatin in breast cancer, either cell line or xenografts, is rather limited, suggesting a uh, tumor static rather than a tumor cytal effect. And the worst of all, we essentially have no clinical data in breast cancer for this drug at this stage. And uh, so, however, we do have data, clinical data for other tumor types um, for this drug, which mostly demonstrated the stable disease. And there's only one case of objective response, which is actually uh, with the combination of tivatinib and alatinib. And uh, this drug is all further compounded with the problem of lacking a validated predicted biomarker. Um, and however, it does have a candidate, a potential predicted biomarker that is CMAT and the receptor or its ligands, uh, HGF, which can be the subject for the exploration of this trial. Uh, in addition to the limitations um, to the data we, we, we got, we also take into consideration some other factors when designing this trial. Um, first of all, what is the setting of the disease once tested this drug? And uh, given that this drug has no proven benefit in breast cancer, but it has proven toxicities uh, in cancer patients. So this dictates where this drug should be tested initially. We want to go to a patient population that they have no further standard of care available to them. Um, and also, the second question is, what will be the appropriate ethics endpoint to define the therapeutic benefit of this drug? Um, in the previous slide, I showed you we believe this drug is probably a tumor static agent rather than a tumor cytal agent. As a result, we do not really expect substantial response rate associated with this agent in breast cancer. As a result, we propose progression-free survival as the primary ethics endpoint of this agent uh, in preference over objective response. And uh, since PFS is a time to event endpoint, our uh, uh, distinguished speakers have emphasized that uh, for really a time to event endpoint, you really need a, ran you need a control arm. So a randomized trial will be a preference. And uh, in the end, uh, we're in, in the end, we, we really trying to develop the drug in breast cancer. So we need to understand the magnitude of the benefit. Is it clinically relevant? So these are the key considerations when we propose the trial. And uh, I will show you the actual schema in the next slide. But, but before that, I want to tell you the team reached consensus the randomized discontinuation design is the best choice uh, to fit this purpose for what we're trying to do. And uh, the team also hypothesized that in subjects with HER2 negative or normal metastatic breast cancer and uh, having a stable disease at end of 12 week period uh, treatment with tivatinib, uh, patients randomized to tivatinib would have a superior PFS relative to the control arm uh, with placebo. Now this is the study schema. The study would consist of three study periods with a leading period for 12 weeks 
with open label access to Tibetan monotherapy. And uh, at the end of the, let's see if I can find the laser pointer. Okay, got it. So at the end of the leading period, what we do a tumor assessment. Um, based on the response that the patient get at the end of the leading period, we will decide what to do with these patients. So if a patient achieved the objective response, be it a complete or partial response, this patient should continue to receive open-label tivatinib because this patient is clearly benefiting from a such treatment. On the other hand, if a patient had a progressive disease or unacceptable toxicity during the leading period, this patient should come off study and off treatment. The patients that are really interested to this um, trial is really the patients who have stable disease at the end of 12 week lead, um, leading period because as we know, um, a subset of breast cancer patients, even in metastatic setting, could have rather indolent disease, um, meaning the natural history of disease is really slow growing. So a stable disease at the end of 12 week um, leading period may be due to simply a slow growing tumor um, versus a, a treatment effect with tivatinib. So this randomization into uh, receiving tivatinib or placebo uh, would allow us to dissect out uh, which is which between insulin disease versus the treatment effect. And we also building a third uh, period, which is crossover uh, period. So for those patients who are randomized to placebo, at the time of progression, they would have the option to receive uh, tivatinib. This probably is going to be a feature welcomed by the patients. And uh, at the bottom, you can see that the patient population were going after HER2 uh, normal patients, considering for HER2 positive space, there are so many treatment options. We want to stay away from it. And in terms of stratification factor, because of the importance of triple negativity versus not having triple negativity, both on biology and treatment options, this would be an important stratification factor. Uh, in addition, ECOG is always going to be important. And the primary endpoint is PFS and preferably to be assessed by independent radiology review committee. Another feature of this design is that we're going to prospectively collect tissues from all patients. And uh, we reserve the option to retrospectively analyze for biomarkers. The lead candidate biomarkers are CMAT and it's like an HGF. The primary objective of this trial is to compare PFS um, between tivatinib and placebo in randomized subjects um, who have obtained a stable disease and that those are the patients get actually randomized. A key secondary objective is really a subset of ITD population. Um, this is a biomarker positive subset one estimate the treatment effect, see if biomarker is enriching for treatment benefit to these patients. So the candidate biomarker is CMAT in this case. With the help of Jack, we actually were able to give you some numbers as well. And the team had assumptions for a target hazard ratio of 0.6, uh, which corresponds to a median PFS of three months for the control arm and five months for the treatment arm. And the, and the hazard ratio of 0.6 was chosen based on really benchmarking uh, recent examples in metastatic breast cancer, uh, with the most recent example being Affinitor uh, mTOR inhibitor in hormone positive. Um, a subset of metastatic breast cancer in second line setting. And we believe 0.6, the hazard ratio is probably uh, um, a reasonable uh, threshold for clinical relevance. So uh, we also assumed um, the alpha would be a two-sided 10% with a power of 80%. So based this, on these assumptions, uh, and Jack was super quick, uh, just a few minutes uh, amazingly, to give us the sample size. Um, we were told we need 87 patients randomized. Actually, I think, Jack, maybe you're, uh, maybe, uh, you're referring really to the na number of events here, right? 87 events. So actually, actual sample size would be bigger considering not all patients will give you events. Uh, we typically assume 70 to 80% patients will give you event. So you need to add about another 20 to 30% to the sample size actually shown on this slide. And also we assume 50% of patients would have stable disease because the choice of randomized discontinuation is really based on the assumption you will have a substantial proportion of patients to have stable disease 
in order for this trial to be feasible. So if you have 10% patients or less give you stable disease, it would take forever uh, to get enough number of patients to randomized, get randomized. And uh, we also assume the accrual rate would be about seven patients per month, and it would take about 12 months to fully accrue the study. And uh, we would probably follow for at least another six months in order to get a required number of events uh, for the final analysis. I believe this is the last slide. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding to the, your, your study design, because I noticed this is the a CMAP, um, tar, uh, targeting CMAP pathway, and uh, you mentioned that there, uh, at the time of we designed this trial, there were a lack of evidence on the uh, predictive value, and you're going to do some retrospective or marker analysis to understand the CMAP. Um, actually, my, my, my suggestion is that whether you consider to use CMAT as a stratification factor so that because I think based on the current understanding, we already have some understanding of the drug targeting CMAT, also the CMAT uh, prognostic value in breast cancer. So I think maybe it, it, it's better that we use CMAT as one of the strategic factors, although you recruit all the patients, you, you recruit patients, uh, I mean all common patients, I think that will enable you in the future to understand further um, the CMAT, uh, the prognostic value and also the predict value of the CMAT in this, uh, in, in this subgroup of patients. Sure. That's a very good point. I fully agree with you. If we have an essay that is available and sometimes we don't have technically validated essay uh, which has been developed in lab so you wouldn't be able to do it up front. However, if essay is available, I fully agree with you. We should stratify. Um, at randomization uh, to, to really balance out uh, the potential impact of CMAT either as a predictive or prognostic factor here. Fully agreed. Um, the second question is regarding to the primary endpoint PFS per IRC. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to uh, 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 assess any PFS by the investigator, even not in your secondary endpoint. Uh, well, we always just uh, choose not to uh, crowd out the slide. There will be investigator assessment as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.